Well, good evening. Welcome to the this installment of the Hagen History Center's Fall 2021 Speaker Series. I'm Jeff Sherry, Museum Educator at the Hagen History Center. Our speaker tonight is Mr. Jeff Kidder, President of Kidder Architects LLC in Erie, Pennsylvania. His talk tonight is entitled "A 33-year-old, excuse me, a 33-year, 3,000-mile journey." why Frank Lloyd Wright, Aaron Green, San Francisco field office is now in Erie. Before I turn it over to Jeff, just a few announcements from the Hagen History Center. We are currently open to the public six days a week from 10 to five, featuring new exhibits in the Watson Curtsy Mansion, the Wood Morrison House, and Frank Lloyd Wright's original San Francisco field office and other architectural exhibits in our brand new exhibit building. Our staff has created many blogs and videos that are available on our website at www.eriehistory.org. We encourage you to check those out regularly. Jeff Kidder has earned degrees from Arizona State University, the University of Virginia, and the Leadership Erie Program at Ghana University in Erie. Currently, the president and architect at Kidder Architects LLC and is very active in, Erie, in the Erie community and has served on numerous boards, including Perry Square Alliance, Erie Downtown Partnership, Reservation Erie, the Erie County Historical Society's Properties Committee, the Erie Club, and the American Institute of Architects. Mr. Kidder has over 30 years of experience in all aspects of the architectural profession and brings a wealth of knowledge and vision to a wide spectrum of building types and planning projects. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jeff Kidder. Jeff? Hey, thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> uh, again, my name is Jeff Kidder. I'm an architect here in Erie. Um, we're gonna be talking about the Frank Lloyd Wright Aaron Green San Francisco field office um, and why it's not in San Francisco anymore and why it's now here in Erie at the Hagen History Center. Um, to begin with, uh, I'm gonna start with today, now, um, what the office looks like. And these are, there's gonna be several photos here of the reconstructed 1951 designed um, office that used to be in downtown San Francisco. Uh, then we'll um, kind of run through this, but this is as it looks now. Um, and then we'll get into its history and then how it ended up here. So in general, um, it's about a 900 square foot office space that was in an existing building in downtown San Francisco on Grand Avenue. Um, and this is it currently right now at the History Center. And these photos were taken a few months ago. So it, um, I'll show you some later photos of it, more current. But um, the Hagen History Center is also home of the Erie County Historical Society. Um, this is their campus at 356 West 6th Street in the West 6th Street Historic District, uh, just west of downtown Erie. Um, it comprises several buildings. The primary building on the left is the Watson Curtsy Mansion, completed about 1891 in Richardsonian Romanesque style. Um, behind it um, here is the carriage house. Uh, that The house is now a museum. Um, historic house and gallery space. The carriage house has been converted into the visitor center and reading room archives. And um, behind it is an archive building. And then the Wood Morrison house is here in the front, right, um, 1858, Italian 8, which is now also a um, gallery and an education center. And the last most recent building is this building here that looks like a barn, but is um, basically a brand new building. And um, we'll explain um, a little bit later on why that building is, but that is now called the exhibit building and um, houses gallery space and the Frank Lloyd Wright Aaron Green office. So just quickly, because the main topic of this lecture is the office itself, but Frank Lloyd Wright is one of the two individuals responsible for this office. Um, he is probably, or is the most well-known um, American architect of all architects, I believe. Um, and he really practiced architecture for 72 of his 91 um, uh, years. So he was a very prolific, very active, very important, very influential architect. 
and the era that we're going to be focusing on with the office is in the last decade of his practice. So here's an early photo of him. And then photo on the right is, um, is Mr. Wright in the 50s inside the office, which you can kind of see here in the background. We'll talk again a little bit more about that. Um, not going to go into Wright's architectural history at this point because there's a lot out there on it. But um, these, this is the um, Roby House from his early years in Chicago. Um, the Falling Water in the mid-30s in Pennsylvania, all the way up to the Guggenheim um, in New York City. Um, built or designed uh, at least around a thousand projects, um, of which about half of them have been built in one way or another. So the other person in that's important to this story is Aaron Green. So Aaron, 50 years younger than Mr. Wright, um, grew up in Mississippi and went to Cooper Union to study architecture, went back to Mississippi for a little bit to his hometown and had, um, had knowledge of Wright, um, but there was a, a client came to him, a potential client, and asked uh, Aaron to design a house and Aaron felt that, um, that these, this couple should hire um, Wright to design their house. So they went and, and contacted Mr. Wright and he, they, they did hire him. And um, Mr. Wright really appreciated um, Aaron doing that. And as a result, basically had him manage that project in, in Mississippi. Um, and that kind of began the relationship between Green and Wright. Um, Green eventually went to Taliesin and joined the fellowship. And here he is um, at, in Taliesin West in Scottsdale in 1941, um, participating in the fellowship, um, learning and helping Wright with his projects. I, he went off to participate in World War II. And when he came back, uh, he eventually ended up in um, San Francisco area. So when Mr. Wright found out that Green was going to be in San Francisco or relocating there, he had a strong interest in establishing a presence in Northern California. So um, he talked to Aaron and asked him if they could uh, basically form a relationship, a partnership, and have Aaron be his representative in Northern California or California in general. So here's early years with Aaron and Mr. Wright. And then this is a later photo of Aaron again in the office here uh, in San Francisco. So this is a 1950s, <clears throat> 57 photo of Aaron and Mr. Wright um, when he visited uh, San Francisco. He would come several times a year to meet with clients, um, check on projects. So he was kind of in and out. And um, they really, they needed a home base. They needed an office. So Aaron looked around and in 1951, he located um, vacant space in this building here in 319 Grant Avenue, which is just half a block from one of the entrances to Chinatown and um, <clears throat> shared it with Mr. Wright. And he said, well, I, I know that office because there was another uh, Taliesin Fellowship architect that worked out of that office at one point. The building also, um, he was he liked the building too because it kind of uh, reminded him of Chicago and the geometric facade um, he also liked. So in 1951, <clears throat> they signed the lease to um, occupy the second floor of this multi-tenant building. So there was a door here on the lower right, you went up a common stair and you went up to that second floor office. So what's interesting about this office itself, even though it's a 900 square foot basically interior, fit out project is Wright really only designed three properties for himself, one being his home and studio in Chicago that he um, occupied up into the teens. And then Taliesin in Spring Green, Wisconsin um, that evolved and developed over the years. And then lastly, Taliesin West in Scottsdale that again evolved over time. So the office in San Francisco was basically the fourth, he was his own client. And he and Aaron um, in 1951, and this is a current photo of it, but this would be the, the lobby, 1951, 
communicated back and forth and shared drawings and sketches um, about the design. And we have a series of letters here um, back and forth between them, which are interesting to read. Um, they're very personal and um, they talk about other projects too that were going on at the time. But um, uh, Aaron writes, San Francisco does love you, Mr. Wright. We find a very cooperative and friendly spirit most everywhere we go and on and on. So there's also discussion about they wanted to um, build office out of birch. Um, they couldn't find um, enough material or the right kind of wood. So they ended up going with redwood, which is what the office is constructed out of. But um, after initial discussion, Aaron came up with this plan for the office and um, sent it off to Mr. Wright um, for review and comment. And this is the drawing that came back, um, just as any design evolves, you never end up where you start. Um, and Wright really worked it um, to the better. Aaron had a good start, um, but he put his touch onto it. And what's interesting about this building is it's not very big. The 900 square foot is the footprint of the building. So, and it, and it really only has um, windows on one side, which would be the bottom here where the three arrows are rest of the building is, um, is windowless. So um, the plan, you came up a stair, common stair, and this is the front door where the arrow is. And then there's basically three primary spaces, the reception area, the drafting room, and the inner private office. Um, now the ceilings in the space are roughly about 16 feet, but, um, you'll see in, or you might have seen already or seen in the in the photos coming up that there's this soffit that links all these spaces together that you pass um, through and under. And um, that's at six foot, 10 inches high under a 16 foot ceiling. So there's a, there's a lot of spatial interest going on, a lot of you know compression and release and um, glass ceilings, high ceilings, wood ceilings, and this angle, 120 degree angle kind of plays out through all the, the general parti and a lot, and then into all the details. So this is the earliest photo that I've been able to find of it. And it was dated 1951. So this is a view of the drafting room here uh, when it was basically brand new. Aaron and another architect built it themselves from uh, the final drawings that they had right stamp of approval on. Um, in regards to other right designs, it's very simple, uh, it's very pure, and um, it really it kind of boils down to the essence of, of his ideas of organic architecture, which I'm not going to go into at this point. It can be another talk. But um, at the, so 1951, the office opens and Aaron is busy, um, spends the next eight years working on some of his own pro projects too, because he still maintained his own practice, but his main focus was um, Mr. Wright's projects. About 30 projects or so were worked on in that time, of which not many were built, but this is one of them. It's a residence, Burger Residence, 1953, and these are some, some drawings of it. You can see the angle. Um, you can see a lot of similarities in the thinking of we saw in the office, but this being an object in the landscape versus the office being um, inside a box. And the house is built, it's north of San Francisco and it's still there today. Um, another house kind of happened in the earlier years of this office is the Walker residence in Carmel, California, south of San Francisco, um, right on the Pacific Ocean. Um, other projects that never uh, became built at a completely different scale of the house is the Lenkert Electric. Um, built building, which is 1955. Um, it was a microwave and telephone company that was full construction drawings were done, contract was ready to be released to the general to the construction contractors, and then um, the company got bought out by somebody else and the, the project was um, just never happened. Um, but a lot of his ideas at the time were implemented in into here and similar ideas you see in, in Johnson Wax. Another project that came out of this office that, that was not built, but the Butterfly Wing Bridge um, was Wright's design 
for a new bridge connecting San Francisco across the bay um, to the mainland. Um, it was, again, qu quite a different scale than the houses. Um, cast or concrete, um, really large uh, park in the middle. And um, there was a model built of it that was displayed heavily around San Francisco area. And, and here is the model here. It was displayed on a 16 foot diameter mirrored table, which you can see here. And um, this is Aaron on the, the left, and he was completely involved with this project all along. Um, here's Mr. Wright sitting in the reception area of the office with the model, part of the model here in the, in the mid-50s. And um, this is just a, a more recent um, computer rendering of the model done by um, an individual that's been um, taking some of Wright's unbuilt projects and making them into the more photorealistic um, images. So this is what the bridge, you can see the scale, looking at a sailboat here, it's huge, um, but it never happened. Um, kind of the main really important project that this office was involved with, as well as Talius and, and, and Fellowship in general, was Marin County Civic Center, which Aaron was um, pretty much involved with right um, getting the job, being interviewed for the job. Uh, Aaron had done other work for the, for the county and um, just really um, thought Wright would be the, the, the best architect for this. Um, it ended up being designed in the 50s, but was not constructed until after Mr. Wright passed away. But it was built in phases and um, is his largest um, public building um, built. And this is just a view of it. Um, kind of spanning between the hills in Marin County, um, north of San Francisco. Uh, the office, Aaron was um, like a superintendent project architect of this and his office in San Francisco because they were just not that far away. So um, he was really um, heavily involved with getting this through to completion. And then this is a photo of Aaron in the middle and Mr. Wright and Aaron's wife at the time, uh, Jean. Um, and it says here on the draw, on the photo, Taliesin Easter of 1959. So Easter that year was March 29th, and um, uh, Mr. Wright passed away just on April 9th. So just a little over a week, week and a half later after this photo was taken. So when he passed away, that that really obviously ended his um, direct involvement with the office, and. This is a good reference if you want to learn more about Frank Lloyd Wright and Aaron Green in San Francisco by Paul Turner. Um, this book here is, is really a great resource for that time period. Now, from 1960 to 1988, um, Aaron, Green associate, Aaron Green and Associates maintained their office here on Grant Street. Um, they kept this office on the second floor as it was, and as they grew, they took over the third floor and the fourth floor of the building and, um, and worked out of here. And um, here's just some 1960s photos of um, life in the day of an architect in, in this office in San Francisco. Um, just important people in, in, in Wright's life and in Aaron's life and in Eliasson. Um, over the years, worked here, worked out of this office. And um, here's a January 1965, having a little party. But it's just kind of, it's interesting to see um, life at that time. I'm not gonna go into a lot of Aaron's Green's um, project at this point, because there's um, we're focusing on the office, but this monograph of his work recently came out and it's just a great um, uh, tribute to, his time working in Northern California and all the projects he worked on. So if you're interested in Aaron Green, this is a good resource. So the office um, stayed as it was originally designed in 51 and was kind of set up as uh, you know, a memorial uh, memory of Wright. So these are some undated photos, but probably 70s, um, 80s of, of what the office looked like and how it was um, maintained by Aaron. Um, being into the late 80s, um, the real estate 
a boom in economy and San Francisco um, made this location not affordable for them anymore. It's an office, so they decided to move to another um, location and vacate this building. And with that, um, Aaron made the decision to um, sell the interior um, rather than leave it there, take it himself. And um, 1988, um, the office was documented, um, measured, drawn, and um, every piece numbered. And this is one of the drawings for that. And a lot of information about the building and interior shell was also on there. And it was dismantled and sold to, um, to um, Tom Monahan, who wore a couple hats at the time. He was founder of Domino's Pizza. He owned the Detroit Tigers baseball for about 10 years. He um, was a car collector and he was a right um, aficionado and um, was collecting right objects, items, archives, houses in Michigan. And he purchased the office interior, um, the butterfly bridge model and um, other um, archival materials from Aaron and um, moved it all to um, Ann Arbor. And also going on at that time was the beginning of a multi-phase project called Domino's Farms, which is this mile long building here that exists today. And that is still home to Domino's Pizza, although he's no longer um, involved with it. But they still um, occupy space here. And <clears throat> in the building right now, and this was just taken this year, but they do have in the common area, one of the hallways, they do have some right, a little mini right gallery with models of some of the buildings and images and some artifacts and archive material that's just available for anybody in the building to look at. And that's there. But in 1992, only four years after buying it, um, he made a decision to sell the office. He, it was never um, assembled. It was just in the crates that were packed in in 1988 and just was in a warehouse. And the decision to sell it to the Heinz Architectural Center <clears throat> at the Carnegie Art Museum in Pittsburgh, um, they were creating this, this new kind of um, um, center within the larger museum. And um, here it is, um, reconstructed the office. Now they treated it a little differently than we have it right now where you basically looked in, these are their recreation of the windows that were on the front of the uh, Grant Avenue building. And you stood in this hallway and you looked into the office. Um, as a general uh, visitor to the museum, you were not able to get into the office. So it was a little bit different um, way of displaying it. And you can see it here through the windows. Uh, these are some <clears throat> images of it reconstructed that at that time in the early, uh, about 94. And um, what's interesting is Aaron was <clears throat> excuse me, was still alive in 94. He, he passed away in 2001. So he went to Pittsburgh and um, helped the, the staff there um, with curating it and staging it. And so this is, this is Aaron <clears throat> kind of um, uh, putting his touch to it before they open it to the public. <clears throat> and this is in her office with, again, um, just making adjustments. So it's interesting that he got to see it reassembled um, really just um, about six years after it was disassembled. And these are a little blurry, um, but um, this was the office after it was officially um, <clears throat> finished and open for exhibit in Pittsburgh. Now, then it took up basically half the square footage um, it's 900 square feet. It took up about half of the space that the Heinz Architectural Center had within the museum. And um, in 2004, the decision was made to, to, to take it down <clears throat> and use the space for other, other uses for the center. So it was up for about 10 years in Pittsburgh. 
and um, here they're starting to, to, to take it back apart. <clears throat> you can see through the windows here are the crates that it was originally packaged in <clears throat> and they were bringing them back and starting to tear it apart. And here it is um, uh, almost apart and just went back um, into the crates with all the numbers that were originally put there in 88. And um, it was crated up and it was commissioned to sell the bees <clears throat> to go up for auction and um, it never sold. And um, here it is, some of the furniture crated up. Crates are beautiful. It was impeccably packed. <clears throat> so it kind of dropped off the radar for 2004 to 2010. Kind of heard it's that in a warehouse somewhere in New Jersey or Maryland. I'm not sure. I haven't been able to confirm that. But um, around 2010, um, it gets a new owner, the um, Buffalo Transportation Pierce Arrow Museum in, in Buffalo. Uh, Jim Sandoro is the um, owner and operator of the museum. And um, he purchased it with intent to uh, um, reassembling it and having it uh, exhibit within the larger museum. <clears throat> and um, it, 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 it didn't get reassembled at some point, um, but pieces of it were displayed. So here's some furniture and some objects out of the office that were on display within the Transportation Museum. The reason it never got put back together is Jim um, and his architect, Pat Mahoney, um, decided to construct within the Transportation Museum uh, a right design gas station that was never built. Um, it was designed for Buffalo, it never got built. And um, since it's a transportation museum, a gas station makes complete sense. And with the history of Wright in Buffalo, um, they made a decision here to build it within the building and kind of put the focus on that. So the office um, kind of just got left in its crates. Um, so in 2016, um, the patron, Tom Hagen of the Hagen History Center and chairman of the Board of Your Insurance is, is friends with Jim Sandero, and they were talking and Jim said, um, you know, I have this office, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna use it in our museum, maybe, maybe um, it could come to Erie and be in, in your museum. And that was back in 2016. So some of the reasoning for that was um, there's a, a strong presence of right in Buffalo here with the Darwin Martin house and between Erie and Buffalo is Gray Cliff, the Martin's um, summer lake home. And then other, some other um, projects, including his gas station. Um, and then south of Erie, um, just east of Pittsburgh is Falling Water and Kentuck Knob and some other right buildings um, that have um, actually moved there, some houses. So there's a really uh, a, a critical mass of right in Buffalo and a critical mass of right east of Pittsburgh. <clears throat> so if you look here, we have Buffalo at the top and um, south of Pittsburgh at the bottom. And if one is gonna travel between those two spots um, on interstates, including 79 and 90, you're gonna, you're, you have to go through Erie. <clears throat> So the, uh, the idea of the right office, since it already moved a couple times, um, to come to Erie made kind of sense um, now what we would call to continue to enhance and develop a, a right trail in Western Pennsylvania, Western New York. Um, so it was great, um, great idea. Everybody really loved it and was excited. The problem was is there wasn't any place to put it. So here's a, a, a photo from several years ago of the Hagen History Center campus. But um, you can see the mansion, the carriage house, the archive building, the Wood Morrison before it got renovated. Um, and then the Wood Morrison garage or barn. And there really wasn't, wasn't any of these buildings, none of these buildings could handle the office. So we had to come up with a building to put the office in. And that came eventually the exhibit building, which went right there, kind of in the hole of the donut. And um, 
So we began in 2016 with designing um, the building. Here's another aerial view of the campus, but this is the exhibit building that got designed. And it, it was um, meant to, even though it's a new building, um, it was meant to be, have the appearance of being a, I, I guess, part of the campus of the Wood Morrison House, which is 1858, and having that look of a, of a carriage house barn. Um, this was already, um, to the far right, was already the historic barn for the Wood Morrison House, but we tucked it in there so the Watson Kirstie Mansion had its carriage house and the Wood Morrison had its carriage house. So we spent 2016 designing um, the building to accommodate the office um, and then um, built the exhibit building in 2018. <clears throat> And um, we didn't have the office here yet. It didn't physically get here until 2019, but we had these five sheets of drawings that were done in 1988. Um, you know, I did my research from everything I could online, um, archives and stuff like that. I, I saw the office in the 90s when it was in Pittsburgh, but that was a long time ago. Um, and then the office itself was in 27 crates. And here's the crates in a warehouse. And this is between the uh, reconstruction drawings and these crates, this is what we had to go on. Now, I also um, had the opportunity to <clears throat> travel to San Francisco to meet with two new friends of mine. Um, here on the left, um, this is at Marin County Civic Center, but Ann Novi, who um, I reached out to, um, Jan worked for Aaron Green at Aaron Green and Associates starting in 1965 and was with Aaron until um, he passed and Aaron um, made Jan the successor to his firm and he carried it on until Jan retired. So Jan didn't have the direct link to, to Mr. Wright, but he had the direct link and history to Aaron and the office and um, Pretty much, made, and he maintains an incredible uh, collection of of, of Wright um, and Aaron Green archives. So it was important for me to go meet Jan to get him to know us and what we were doing here, and for us to get to know him. And then, gentleman on the right here is Bill Schwarz, who was an, is another architect that worked in Aaron's office. Uh, was very familiar with this office and. He continues to be active in um, the preservation of Marin County Civic Center. So I was able to go out there and meet both of them, spend time with them, um, listen to them, learn from them, uh, kind of dig their mind, their memories. And from that point on for the last couple of years, we've been in constant communication. Um, this is 319 Grant Street on the left, what it looked like a couple of years ago. Uh, the building is still there. I was not able to get up into the space, but um, I was able to document the facade and the windows so that we could re reconstruct them accurately. I was also able to go out to San Francisco again um, this year <clears throat> with um, an architectural writer from Pittsburgh, Charles Rosenblum, who actually did his thesis on right in San Francisco back in the 90s and wrote about the right office when it was in Pittsburgh. Um, so Charles and I went and spent three days with Jan, continuing to learn from him, ask a lot of questions, um, and we just, we had a great time. So, um, Jan's become a good friend and he, his, the success of this project is, um, a lot due, a lot due to him. So after we built the exhibit building, um, we, we knew what the building, the, like the interior shell was because it was all on those deconstruction drawings. So that's what you see here is basically a reconstruction of the San Francisco um, 1909 building shell. And we just started unpacking and carpenters that, that um, my construction company, uh, Kidder Jeffries Construction managed the job, the building and the reconstruction and ca carpenters and electricians and painters and just a bunch of people were involved in putting this back together, but here it is starting to go back together. Um, what's interesting in this photo is because, as I said, we kind of filled in this donut hole on the campus, this dark back um, 
background here is the archive building, but we had existing um, heat and cooling equipment for the building that was right there. So we had to deal with that because that's not really something you want to look at through the window. Uh, but it was important to us to have daylight into this space. And it was important for um, Hagen History Center to have their visitors actually get into the space and experience it um, spatially, three-dimensionally, um, different than it was in Pittsburgh. Um, so these are some photos of it going back together. Um, it is all redwood and um, had some missing pieces, but 95% of it was there. It's a photo of the front door on the left, and it was the original door from the San Francisco office. So, and it had the red, um, right signature red tiles on both sides of the door right here. This was our only piece that had the painted color of the original um, office envelope. So we took that to the paint store, did a computer match on it, and um, <clears throat> just were, were able to feel comfortable that we were um, as accurate as could be with recreating the envelope. Also interesting, just this label on the on the right, Aaron Green. You know, we still find um, Aaron's fingerprints on this. But back in 1967, he sent something to the art department at Florida, Florence State College in Florence, Alabama. I'm sorry, he's that's where he was from. But um, it's just interesting that he shared um, his right experience with other people, um, even back in the 60s. So um, as with anything that you don't have all the information going on and things evolve, we learned through some photographs we found after we had built the shell that these clear storage, these little monitor um, um, transom windows were up here on the right and on the, well, on the left and on the right that weren't on the deconstruction drawings, but we um, were able to, um, through photographic evidence, um, know that they were there and we recreated them. Our, our goal here really is to make this as um, correct and accurate as it existed um, when it was built. Um, we also, uh, through Bill Schwarz um, and, and his efforts at Marin County, um, he sent us a, a, a piece of floor tile that we felt had the right color for the floor that was in this office. Um, we had a custom matched um, rubber tile nine by nine, which is not a standard size anymore, and, and made sure that the floor represented the best we can. This is a photo uh, from the original office space in San Francisco from Pat Mahoney, the architect in, in Buffalo that um, has a lot of experience with right properties that, that he was able to take um, five, six years ago. And, um, we use that building photograph then to create um, vinyl graphics onto the windows of the office. So here's the three big windows of the office. And um, since they were taken from the office itself, we, you know, we felt that that was about as best as we could do. And um, then here it is now, um, what it looks like now with the graphics applied to the window. So we're still give you that feel of being on the second floor that is the building that is across the street, not in the 50s. I mean, it doesn't look like that from the 50s, but it looks like that today. And um, we were able to then hide, um, it took us several rounds of um, different types of material to get the light still to come in, but to get it um, opaque enough that you can't see through. But you saw in the earlier photograph that there's a piece of uh, air conditioning equipment right outside this window, but you can't see it anymore. So we felt, we, have, we feel that that was a, a, a big successful effort on this and really makes you forget that you're in Erie when you walk into the space. Um, the other thing is we found photos um, early on and then afterwards um, on what the curtains draperies were like. Um, it took us two passes to get this one right. The first one ended up not being what we were hoping. So this is a second effort. And we have photographs showing these curtains closed um, back in the 60s. So again, we feel this is um, as accurate as we can be and they do open and close and do work. Um, some furniture pieces were with the office. These are stools. Um, 
that that came on the on the left here is the condition this these three upholstered stools were in when, when we received them. Um, the the stuffed finger fill had completely flattened. They were kind of really filthy and stained. We sent them off to um, Kathy Coho in Philadelphia, a um, um, fabric and upholstery cons conservator that does work for all the uh, museums on the East Coast. And she um, just took the fabric off, cleaned them with all the appropriate um, conservation methods and put um, stuffing back in them to get their shape back. And this is what they look now. So we um, kept all the original fabric. We didn't over clean them. Um, also, just all the woodwork in the whole office, we didn't touch. We didn't do anything to it. It's just how it's um, aged over time. Um, that was just the goal to just keep it, um, keep it how it is. And the fact that it's now, you know, 70 years old. Um, this is um, what it looks like now, today, with continued staging um, going on with the space. Um, Jan Novi, my last trip out to see him, we were able to kind of go through his personal collection and he had um, this Buster Wright that was there um, after Mr. Wright passed away, but Aaron kept it there. This is, um, um, a, a panel from a, a Lewis Sullivan building in Chicago that was torn down. It's a recast from an original that Wes Peters, um, my great son-in-law gave it to Aaron um, as a thank you. And it was displayed there in, in the um, reception area. And some of these other um, elements were original to the office. So this is what it looked like um, coming in. And this is office um, as it looks right now with some more objects that we are on loan from Jan Novi that were original to the office um, during Aaron Green's time. And um, a music box here that Mrs. Wright gave to Aaron, again, as a thank you for his um, involvement with them over the years. Oh, the other thing, this is a, this didn't come with office, but Jan loan, had it and loaned it to us, but this is the original chair that was behind the desk that's now back in its um, you know, original location. Um, our goal here is to make it really look like, um, like everybody just kind of got up and left for lunch or left for the night. It's, it's an architect's office. It's where you know, buildings were designed and created and um, we just wanted to make it feel more alive and we're continuing to develop that and adding more elements to it, but um, it's now open to the public and um, we have drawings on display here that are of the Fawcett House, which is um, about an hour and a half south of, um, southeast of San Francisco, same era as the office, 1950s, um, uses the angles and stuff, but we have a whole series of working drawings and, and photographs of that building. Um, this is Jan Novi. He was in town last week. Um, we had a celebration at the Hagen History Center and Jan was able to travel to Erie and see it for the first time since 1988. And um, we just had a great, had a great time um, with him and um, having him see it again. And at one point we were there, he just, he kind of forgot where he was and, and, and just felt like he was back in downtown San Francisco, looking out the window at Grant Street below. And I think for me and for the everybody involved here at the Hagen History Center, that's the affirmation we needed to, to um, have him kind of have that feeling. And um, we think we accomplished um, what we were striving for from day one after a five year process. Uh, leading into the office, which is this back here through this door is a, is a gallery that has um, exhibits about Erie architecture, um, rights architecture in the region, and currently um, we have on display on loan from the Auburn Court Duesenberg Museum in Indiana is this 1930 L29 cord that um, the Wright, Franklin Wright Foundation that Mr. Wright founded um, purchased in the in 1950 and, and had it until right after his death. But this was a cord that, that 
was in his collection of cars over the years um, that is now um, owned by the Auburn Court Duesenberg Museum, but we've borrowed it here to um, and enhance the display. The Crosley here is, is not directly um, rights, but in the 50s, he had several of these, three to five of them at one time that um, the fellowship um, students would use, and they had them at Taliesin East and West, and they would drive them in the fall and the winter back and forth. And this was um, restored as a tribute tribute type of um, um, example of the type of vehicle, one of the type of vehicles that he had too, and um, the same era as the office itself, 1950. The kind of the last important piece that we have right now on display is the actual Butterfly Bridge model. Um, it is still owned by Tom Monaghan. Um, he did purchase it from Aaron Green in 1988 and still has it. And um, we were able to, um, Mr. Monaghan was um, nice enough to loan it to us for this exhibit. And um, it's here now. And um, it's really kind of a great kind of cherry on top of the whole end of our five-year process here that it's returned um, back to be a part of the office exhibit because that's where it was built and that's where it was housed. And um, it's, just, it's just a great thing to be able to have them all together in one place. So in just to kind of wind down because it is a little convoluted at times, but office itself um, was Frank Lloyd Wright Aaron Green office from 51 to 59. It was Aaron Green's office from 59 to 88. It was on the Tom Monaghan collection from 88 to 92 at the Heinz Architectural Center in Pittsburgh from 92 to 04. Not exactly sure where, where it was from 04 to 10, um, just created up and in storage. And then it went to Buffalo in 2010 until it um, came to Erie in 2019. And it's here and I wasn't sure to write 2020 because that's just when we are, but it's here to stay. Um, we have no intention of it leaving here. And the map below is kind of a diagram of the explanation of the title. It's actually 3,384 3, miles, San Francisco to Ann Arbor, to Pittsburgh, to somewhere on the East Coast, to Buffalo and back to Erie. Um, and 33 years from 88 to, to, to now. Um, again, just a reminder of the uh, individuals involved, Mr. Wright and Aaron Green um, here on the right. And more recent, a big thank you to Tom Hagen and Jan Novi. Uh, this is them visiting Saturday a few days ago. Um, without Tom's um, contribution, donation, and kind of starting this whole idea, we, we wouldn't have it. And without Jan, we wouldn't be able to put the personal long-term history and understanding and evolution of it together and make it really feel alive as, as we, we feel we've made it at this point. So that's the end of my presentation. I wanna thank you. And um, I, I believe Jeff, if there are any questions um, or if there aren't right now, I'm, I'll leave this up, but if you have anything specific, cause there's a lot of information here there's a lot of detail I couldn't get into, but this is my email here if anybody wishes to contact me. Well, thank you, Jeff. Can you hear me now? Yep. I just wanted to thank you so much for a great talk. Um, and I wanna thank all of you who watched online. Mm -hmm. I'd ask you one question and um, that would be, if a, when a visitor comes to the Hagen History Center and sees Frank Lloyd Wright's office, what would you like them to take away? Um, I, f I mean, it's a very modest and small scaled project, especially for him, but it embodies everything that he th thought about in architecture in a very simple manner, almost diagrammatic manner. And I think it would, I mean, it, people need to understand that good architecture, good experiences, good design, good 
spatial experience doesn't have to be expensive or complicated. Um, things can be done very simply and, um, and just kind of spend a little bit of time in there um, and kind of think about it a little bit um, and don't just kind of cruise in and cruise out and just take it at face value because architecture is meant to be experienced three-dimensionally and looking at photos all day of stuff doesn't do it. I mean, you got to walk and experience these spaces. So I just would like people to think about that good design doesn't have to be expensive or complicated. Exactly right. One thing that I've noticed when you walk down the hallway into the drawing room, you have that feeling of compression and the release when you come out into, into the architectural drawing room itself. And you know, you'll see that at some of Wright's houses as well. You want to expand on that as an architect? Because I'm certainly not. <laughs> well, again, I mean, it's, it's architecture is about a, is experiential and it's about a sequence of events. And one way to have a different experience is to, to go through, to, to experience spaces differently. It's tight, wide open, um, in sequence, um, closure, and um, the, this, this isn't, you just, this whole idea of these open concept plans that people live in today where you just do everything in one big room you know, it is fine, but it's a pretty boring experience. It's a pretty, um, um, you know, just a utilitarian thing. And, and really architecture need, should be more than just that. And- um, well, Would you just, agree that he was the, um, basically the inventor of that open plan? Well, I, I mean, I think in a very, you know, oversimplified manner he was doing stuff ahead of his time than what was typical at various points through his career but he wasn't just like knocking all the walls down and just making one big room I mean he was sculpting he was shaping he was you know every everything here has a reason and nothing there's if you start you can't really just start taking pieces of it away because it all makes sense. Everything relates to it. And it's part of the organic architecture. It's not organic in that it's plant-like or grows out of the ground or anything. It's organic that everything relates and responds to everything else and has a reason. And, um, you know, that's really what good architecture is about is the experience, the, the reasoning behind it, and, um, and just making a place you want to be in. Great. Well, Jeff, we have no questions from Facebook, so I want to thank you and all of you who watched online. Our next talk will be Friday, October 1st, 2021 at 6 p.m. when architectural historian Charles Rosenblum will present the second talk in the three-part series about the architectural genius of Frank Lloyd Wright. Jeff, thank you for presenting tonight. Good night to you.